Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's webcast. Uh, before we get started, I'd like you to notice that you have a text box on your screen for asking questions. Feel free to send in questions during or immediately after the presentation, and we'll conclude tonight's session with a Q&A. This evening, I have Dr. John Chamas and Dr. Tra Taylor Strange joining me. Here at Oculus, we do our best to give you excellent products and service, and we wouldn't be able to do that without the support of doctors like Dr. Shamus and Dr. Strange. And on behalf of Oculus, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, we sincerely are grateful that they could be here tonight and share their experiences and insights on the newest Pinacam model, the Pinacam AXL. So again, thank you for joining. And at this time, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. John Shamus. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is John Shamas. I'm a clinical professor at the Keck School of Medicine of USC, and I'm also in private practice. And uh, our practice is really geared towards cataract surgery. And uh, probably some of you know my interest in IOL calculations and the formulas uh, that we have written through the years. <clears throat> my financial disclosure: I'm a speaker for Oculus, and also my post LASIK formulas are licensed to different companies uh, for calculations. Uh, the Pentacam AXL has kept all the anterior segment scanning information that's available in the regular Pentacam and added new feature. So in addition, it measures the axial length and the IOL power. And tonight, I would like to discuss with you how the AXL how it does the axial length measurement and the IOL power calculation. First, the axial length measurement. This is a, a schematic taken from uh, the Oculus uh, uh, people that shows you that the optical biometry used in the Pentacam AXL is similar to the IOL Master 500 it uses partial coherence interferometry uh, where the light is beamed into the eye and back to the machine and it gives you the measurement of the eye. And if you want to look, it gives you also a printout of that measurement. And uh, if you, you can notice, I'm putting my arrow on it, this spike in here shows you that the measurement is quite high the spike is quite high, the measurement is quite accurate, and it gives you the measurement of the axial length. Very similar to what the IOL Master 500 gives you. The question always arises, is the measurement done by the Pentacam AXL as precise as the IOL Master? Because the IOL Master has been for the past X number of years, the, the basic uh, the basic uh, unit that everyone compares their measurements to. Here are some results. We did uh, a 400 eyes of 400 patients between uh, our offices in California and uh, two other offices in Germany. And these were the results, basically. The average axial length, the arithmetic difference was very nil. Uh, standard deviation 0 0.04, the median absolute error of 0 0.026 millimeter, and this is the range below 0 0.1 of a millimeter. And the R2, which is the how they correlate together, it was 0 0.999. You cannot get uh, anything closer than that. So we know for a fact that the measurements taken with the Pentacab AXL is good and precise. You know that the Pentacam has multiple reports for whichever way you want to look at. Some of the most popular reports, the one of the first one is a general overview printout with a three-dimensional schematic in here. It's nice to look at, but I don't think it helps us as cataract surgeons by a lot. The one that I like is the fast screen report. And the fast screen reports takes multiple components of the cornea, the anterior chamber, and it looks at the variation in each one of them. And it gives you like uh, the green means within normal and the red is abnormal. And it tells you 
if the corneal thickness or the case or the anterior chamber are within normal limits compared to the general population or it's not. And on the bottom, if they have the Ambrosio, the Ambrosio uh, scale and it tells you if the cornea is suspicious uh, of having uh, uh, deformities. Like keratoconus. The cataract evaluation printout, I depended on that form for uh, the past few years before the AXL put in the IOL calculation forms. And basically because of the values that are printed in here with the wavefront. However, now all these values are transposed and they are also appearing on the IOL power calculation reports, which means I really do not need that form anymore. Uh, personally. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the IOL calculation reports. The nice part about the Pentacam AXL is that it does for you the routine calculations, the toric calculation, the post lazy calculations without you having to go to the ASCRIS website and do calculations or to do special calculations for the post lazy and uh, it's all included in the machine and with a, just a click of a button, it gives it to you. Let's talk first of all about the routine cases. As you know, the SRKT, Holiday 1 and Huffer Q formulas require the axial length and the K readings to calculate the IOL power. The highest formula requires not only the axial length and the K readings, but also the ACD, anterior chamber depth, to calculate the IOL power. The nice part with the Pentacam AXL, it measures all these parameters and it has personalized these constants in the machine uh, specifically for the Pentacam. This is the printout that comes out with the IOL calculation report. And then you can see on the first section on the top is the demographics with the patients, the surgeon, the dates, and what have you. The second section in the middle gives you all the calculations that are relevant to the case. And the third portion on the bottom part gives you the calculations with the different formulas. So let's look at uh, each part separate. Let's look first at the measurements uh, that taken. QS means the quality and it's okay, that's great. SNR means the signal to noise ratio. You want it to be above 3.5. If it is 51, that's a fantastic measurement. The target refraction is zero. Uh, surgically induced astigmatism, it, we included it, so for the toric calculation, that we'll talk about it later. It gives you the axial length measurement, the ACD. The nice part is the ACD is measured in the optical axis and not through a side illumination like the IOL master. It gives you the pupil diameter, it gives you the white to white, and it gives you additional information on the bottom, and we're going to talk about them a little bit uh, later. On the right hand side, you have the K readings. Sim K is a simulated K. Uh, it's identical to the K readings that are taken with the IOL Master, the Landstar, or any machine. And they are from the anterior corneal surface. And we call it the Sim K at 15 degrees, is because it's taken with topography and not uh, through uh, regular keratometry. So let's talk about the, the special things that are of interest to us as cataract surgeons and why it's important. The cord mu, the cord mu is the distance between the visual axis and the pupillary axis, what we usually call the angle kappa. And what's its importance? The importance is that patient with a cord mu that exceeds 0.3 of a millimeter might not be suitable for a multifocal IOL. They will have aberrations on the side. And we see these mainly in hypermetropes. It's not very often that I see it, but every now and then you can get a case like that. So it's nice to have it. Then the other two are related to the wavefront. Uh, you might be familiar with the Zernike polynomial, and the aberrations are at different levels, first, second, third. The fourth level in here is dominated by the spherical aberration, 
and the last two lines are the high order of aberrations. So let's talk about the spherical aberration. Why is it important? Most of us have a, when we get older, our spherical aberration increase a little bit and becomes in the range of 0.3. And the eyes with the spherical aberration of 0.1 or higher, which is most of us, will do very well with a spherical IOL. Why do we do good with an aspherical IOL? Is because most of the aspherical IOLs correct approximately between 0.2 and 0.3 of this uh, aberra spherical aberrations, and it will bring it down from 0.3 to 0 or 0.1, which gives us a better clarity of vision. However, if you have eyes with a uh, the fourth spherical aberration of less than 0.1, then they might do better with a spherical IOL like the Bosch and Lom or the bifocal IOLs. And uh, so not to push them into the minus side of the spherical aberration. And this is especially considered in patients that have hyperopic LASIK. Just happen to see. How about the high order aberrations? Eyes with a high order aberration index exceeding 0.35 micrometer might not be suitable for a multifocal IOL. I got burned long time ago on a case like this and I had to replace the implant before I even knew about the existence of these high order aberrations. And it's especially in patients that had prior myopic LASIK and the old kind of LASIK, we see more of the high order aberrations than uh, the newer kind of LASIK. Now, the third part of that page on routine calculations, you have four quadrants. Uh, I personally like to do all the calculations for one M. I use the Acrisoft SN60WF. Uh, you might be using something different. You're free to use whichever one you want. You can customize it in any way you want. I personally like to do one implant, and I look at the Huygens formula, SRKT formula, Holiday One formula, and Hopper Q formula. And of course, you can add the newer formulas if you would like. And then I can make my judgment on which one the power makes the most sense for me to use for the patient. You might be using two kinds of lenses and or you might have a preference for one formula. So you can customize it to have one formula with four lenses, two formula with two lenses, whichever way you like, it doesn't matter. You can customize it to your liking. Let's talk a little bit about the toric calculations. And this is the printout of the toric calculations. The first part is the demographics. The second part are the values that are measured. And the third part are the calculations. And let's look at it again. As you notice in here, in addition to the simul simulated K, the sim K that was present on the routine calculations, there is a an addition called the total corneal refractive power, TCRP. And why do we need this TCRP for the toric calculations? If correcting the astigmatism is part of your surgery, you need to calculate the total corneal astigmatism. The SIMK that you see in here and all other biometer Ks, they only measure the astigmatism produced by the anterior corneal surface, while the total corneal refractive power map that you see the values in here, it uses ray tracing to measure the total corneal astigmatism produced by the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces. There have been so many articles written in the past year in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery that show that the measurement of the posterior corneal surface and the measurement of the total corneal astigmatism is extremely important when you correct astigmatism. Otherwise, if it is a with the rule astigmatism, you might overcorrect it. And if it's against the rule astigmatism, you might undercorrect it if you do not take the total corneal refractive power into consideration. And this is and this is the calculation in here. 
And you notice that for the calculation, the you use Heige's formula using the average case taken from the sim k, and then for the toric calculation, they take the total corneal refractive power and not the sim k. And the important part is that for the calculation in here, you have to use the regular k to calculate the power of the implant, which is in here. And however, when you calculate for the toricity, you have to take it from the total corneal refractive power. I mean, it used to be an exercise for me to take all these measurements and do all the calculations. Now the machine gives it to me automatically. And for this patient, if I want to use a toric implant, I will end up using a 22 diopter T3 and it gives you exactly what the ratio to a refraction and what you have to use. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the post-LASIK cal calculations. And this is the printout from the post-LASIK calculation. And on this section, you will notice it's exactly the same information that you have. Uh, if you know the pre-refractive surgery power of the K, you can put them in here so for the special calculations. If you do not have them, then you cannot put anything. The Pentacam people, they base their measurements on, the, on my formula, the Shamas PL formula. Basically, uh, there are multiple studies, but the, oh, the best one, the meta-analysis study, evaluated the prediction error with all available formulas compared to the highest L formula. And they found that if you do not know the amount of lazy correction, the Shamas PL formula has the least prediction error, while the clinical history method and all the other formulas have much higher prediction error. Based on that, the Dr. Podvin took cases from Dr. Hill and using my formula, and he adjusted some of the measurement taken from the Pentacam and they compared them and he could tweak it so they can get a much better result than the Higgs L formula using the measurements from the Pentacam and the Shamas PL formula. Then you look at the calculation down in here uh, you have your four squares in here. They have the hill potvin shamas formula on this side. And they also, you can have the double K SRKT, the double K holiday one, or the double K Hoffer Q formula. However, remember, if you are not sure of the amount of correction that was done, or exactly how much the K power before you do the refractive surgery, or if the patient had multiple refractive surgeries, then these values that you see here, here, and here are not valid at all. They are the highest errors that you can see. As far as I am concerned, I go with the, only the one formula in here, and uh, it, it tells you exactly what to use, 21.5. You might end up with 0 0.05. You might want to go a little bit higher, not to make any mistakes, or go exactly with the exact power. It's up to you. But whenever you are not sure of the previous refractive measurements uh, that you have, patient has had, or if you have never seen the patient before, uh, you can base your calculation strictly on the Hill-Pot and Shamas formula. So what I have always liked about the Pentacam is, uh, in, this is in my conclusion, in patients that had prior myopic or hyperopic LASIK, I get better K readings. And I like the wavefront analysis to determine which IOL to use. The patient that had prior RK, I get better central K readings for more accurate calculations. In patients with keratoconus, I confirm the K readings in the optical axis and not on the corneal apex, which is very important that sometimes, I mean, we didn't have enough time to go over all of these things, but with keratoconus, it's very important to take it in the optical axis. There could be one or two diopters difference between the measurements. And if you're contemplating a toric IOL, you definitely have to go with the total corneal refractive power map. And in patients that are contemplating bifocal IOL, I get better assessment of the optical quality with wavefront analysis, which is very important for the final result. 
So, uh, in conclusion, the Pentacam AXL, in, in my head at least, I can see it as a two devices in one. It does the optical biometry. Uh, whenever I'm in doubt and I want to check for different things, I get the fast screen report and then I check for keratoconus especially, or if there are any changes in the anterior chamber. I love the shine fluke imaging and the wavefront analysis that are available on every case. And now, in addition, the IOL power calculations are done automatically on all cases, whether it's a routine case, toric IOL, or post-refractive surgery. I don't have any more to go to the ASCRS website. I don't have to redo special calculations, not unless you enjoy doing these things. You and the nice part is that all of them have been done with customized formulas. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shamas, for your lecture. Um, a lot about what I talk will have some overlap from the first lecture. But as I go through two cases using the um, the Pinicam in my practice, the AXL. And so uh, I'm in private practice in the Fort Worth, Texas, and I'm a consultant for Oculus and Alcon. And you can reach me at my email or on my phone. All right, so I'm gonna present two cases, well, the first case being a toric IL case using the Pinicam XL, and the second case being a post-refractive case and how um, I utilize it in my practice. Um, you know, the power of the, the Pinicam, of course, with its known uh, corneal uh, measurements, the uh, tomographic evaluation, um, it's important, as we know, when we have a toric IOL patient to um, look at the astigmatism in detail, you know, whether it's irregular or regular, irregular or versus regular, uh, determine the source and the magnitude of the astigmatism that we're going to correct in the axis of orientation. You know, as we know, when we, we measure a patient with our subjective and objective refractions, we're measuring the total optical system, anterior cornea, posterior cornea, and the lens. But since the cataract is going to be removed for cataract surgery, we need to be able to measure just the corneal component. And um, older technologies uh, only measure the anterior component. So I had a patient recently, a 45 year old, a 44 year old female who came with me with, uh, you know, young being 44 with PSC cataracts and significant glare at night. And um, she's a high myope, as you can see in her refraction, uh, with about a doctor of a sill, which is in agreement um, with the case in the clinic. Um, she had no other ocular findings. She's right eye dominant and con tore contact lens wear for many years. So plan on going after her dominant eye first. And um, also my practice, I utilize the, um, the Keratograph 5M next to my Pentacam AXL because I like um, the ocular surface features of the Keratograph. And in this um, slide here, we're looking at her stigmatism. As you can see, a nice symmetrical bow tie configuration. Um, she's got about 1.6 diopters of sill on her left eye here at 92 degrees. And then on her right eye, about 1.6 diopters at 97 degrees. And so it's, as we know, it's useful to get many devices to agree with each other whenever we're planning on a um, astigmatism correction. So when we go here to the um, four maps refractive, this is the next um, display I look to, like to look at um, for a um, my toric planning on the Pinicam AXL. And um, you can see here on her axial sagittal curvature, and it's in agreement with pretty much magnitude and alignment from her. Uh, K5 uh, topography readings on both the right and left eye. And um, it's also important to note with the back surface evaluation and the patient on the pinicam, it's in agreement along the axis in both eyes. And I'll show you an example where that can lead you astray um, when it's different if you're only using anterior segment imaging devices. And then on the pinicam, the holiday report. Um, this is looking, I like to look at the screen, you know, for the total um, spherical aberration as Dr. Shamas was alluding to in his talk. Um, the spherical aberrations, fourth, sixth order on the Zernike um, evaluation measurements, they can lead you one way or the other if you're looking at a uh, 
spherical IOL implantation or as spherical IOL um, implantation, which we can get those numbers here on the middle column here as I'm pointing to with a pointer. And you can see she's got a nice amount of prolate cornea, uh, minus 0.25 and 26. And so it gives you um, uh, good information here. And another big value of here is that you can look at the angle, um, the, the angle cap of the accord mu. And as we just learned that, you know, it's important to be, if you're thinking about a multifocal diffractive IOL, that you should be under about 0.35 um, measurement there. And so she's within those parameters. And because being 44, she wants to try to correct everything, her stigmatism, her distance and intermediate and, and, and good near vision. So if we go on over, um, I like to also look at the uh, power distribution map to see um, where the stigmatism lies um, um, within the different ring diameter zones and see if if it makes sense and um, paying particular attention into the three, four and five millimeter zone range. And she's got nice um, measurements in both eyes. And then this is the, the screen where I find um, all that we just talked about is really a lot of it is put onto one screen. So um, whenever um, I use a step four step approach when I'm looking at a toric um, Iowa patient, like in this case, um, step one, I'll go down to the, um, the four millimeter zone, um, looking at um, her regular astigmatism to see, again, if she's going to be a candidate for a presbyopic correcting IOL, multifocal IOL, or an um, extended depth of focus IOL. And she has a nice um, measurement of 0.1. So she's underneath that 0.3 micron measurement for a um, presbyopic correcting eye well. And then step, you know, two, I like to go and look to see if she's got a normal front to back ratio. She's not a prior refractive patient. So she's within the normal parameters, roughly about 82.2 percentage. And she falls within that category. And the nice thing about this display is that it could, it'll highlight yellow or red if you fall outside a parameter. And so it can alert you to pay more attention to a certain zone on your printout. And then um, step three, I'm looking to see, again, back to the spherical aberrations screen on the holiday report. It'll let you know if um, if you're planning on maybe doing an aspheric IOL versus a spherical IOL. Um, I believe the Technus platform is more like a minus 0.27, whereas an Alcon lens is about minus 0.18, and then the VNL lens being zero. So this kind of guides you um, if you um, are going between two different IOLs for your selections on your case. Um, good value to have to look at. And then last, not least on the screen, um, the SIM Ks, of course, are the anterior um, corneal measurements um, versus looking at what is the actual true total corneal refractive power. You know, a lot of the online calculators that go off the anterior corneal measurements but, um, and they compensate for the posterior corneal surface magnitude, but they don't compensate for the axis of the magnitude. And I'll show you an example of this on the next slide where the back axis is different from the front and it can throw you off. And you just don't get that correction on the online torque calculators. They are compensating for the, the magnitude on the posterior corneal surface, but not necessarily the axis. So the, t the total corneal refractive power, which you see here, is um, incorporating both the anterior and posterior corneal shape with corneal thickness using ray tracings to produce a total corneal refractive power. So it's not just good enough to know the front surface or just the back surface. You have to know the relationship between the twos and the pin and cam AXL gives you that information that other machines don't. And so this separates the total eye astigmatism, which is influenced by the lens. And so the total corneal refractive power is that component that's just produced by the cornea itself. So I like to use the axis off of the total corneal refractive power in my toric planning, um, but yet I will use the anterior measurements if you're doing like an online calculator, because most of those are based on the anterior um, surface measurements for the um, magnitude. And you know, as we know, if you can be off alignment on your axis, 
that can affect you. You know, just a three degree misalignment can be a 10% loss of effect. And um, a 15 degree misalignment on your toric IOL can be up to a 50% loss of effect. So it's important to nail your axis just right. So um, here's an example of a, of a patient who I had that has um, four toric IOL. And um, you can see where the anterior and posterior surface here on the, on the right hand display where um, his axis is different by about seven you know, degrees versus his anterior surface. So the, to the total corneal refractive power, if we'll go over here and look on the left um, four maps refractive, you can see where his anterior surface is at one axis of about 24, and then his posterior axis is uh, much different. And so his true net total corneal refractive power axis is actually different than what you would think if you're just measuring off the anterior surface alone. And so um, that's an example there. And then I like the display on the, um, the, the, the calculation. Um, like Dr. Shamas was saying, you, you can select any kind of IOL you want to put in there. Um, you can configure the formulas how you want to use them. Um, recently now, we, the Pentacam XL has the Barrett universal formula to put onto their um, um, calculations. So you can mix and match which however way you feel fit. And um, you get a lot of information on the screen. Again, you know, you get the, the chord value, uh, your high order aberrations. You can even, I like to put um, information, like if the patients had prior LASIK or not, you can put whatever you want in the comment section. So I find that very useful. And um, it's very user friendly and you don't have transcription errors if like a technician's inputting this data, they can type the wrong thing in and you don't have that with the Pentacam XL. So if we go down, um, there's also, you know, the torque tab there where you can select, um, like in this example, using the, um, the Savini torque. And so, um, I won't say too much about that. Dr. Shamas covered that very well, but, um, these different tabs can be customized to the way that you see fit in your, um, IOL planning. And then again, here's the display. I like to take this to the OR with me and, um, gives you that wealth of information that we've been talking about and um, you can put I put this up on the microscope and I can use that for my incision access planning and during the case and so she did very well with her first eye um, and hit her target just right and so um, that's the tort case so you know the take-home points with this case is um, that when correcting astigmatism in your surgical planning we need to calculate the actual total corneal stigmatism and make sure we get the right axis that we've been talking about. The SIMKs, again, only measure the anterior, the stigma corneal surface, so more information is needed to be accurate. Um, and tomography on this um, with the total corneal refractive power that incorporates both the anterior and posterior corneal shape with corneal thickness using ray tracings to produce the uh, true total corneal refractive power. Okay, and then another case here, I just had a post-refractive patient. We see a lot of this now with all these um, post-refractive patients coming in with visually significant cataracts and they want more out of their vision. You know, they want to have, um, have it all. They want to be able to see distance close and, and um, now we're dealt with uh, getting the right calculations for these patients post-refractive. So he's a 66 year old man, three plus NS with good significant glare. He had hyperopic LASIK 11 years ago. He did not like how strong his near point was being minus four and a quarter. Um, he just never really adapted to it. And he wanted presbyopic correction and to, and to reverse his right eye from a near eye to be distance, but also have near at the same time. And so here's his K5 topography um, view here. And you can see it's more of a kind of a asymmetric bow tie with a skewed axis. Um, in the right eye, and this is his near eye after hyperopic LASIK, and then his left eye, um, a little irregular here, but about half a doctor of sill. And so looking for agreement with between the different instruments, we can see that, you know, his four map refractive is pretty similar to what I had on the other screens, not a lot of surprise there. And um, again, looking at all his values, you can see that his 
total gross spherical aberration is closer to zero than his left eye. And so having all this um, in one report coming up, and that's the cataract um, pre-op report. So um, in planning on him, you know, he's got significant um, cylinder in his right eye. And so got to adjust, you know, for his astigmatism, which he's within one degree axis, which is good compared his MK to his total corneal refractive power. And the magnitude is pretty similar. But like the doc Dr. Shamas was mentioning, you know, you want to be careful not to overcorrect or undercorrect. So like if you were to correct based on 1.6 diopters on his anterior case, you can theoretically, you know, flip his axis to make them from with the rule against the rule. And so I take those measurements into consideration. And so we try to leave him a little width and not aggressively overcorrect his with the rule astigmatism. And so, but all this information is available here on the Pentacam AXL, you know, just at a click of a button, we get information within 60, uh, within 30 seconds. It's pretty amazing. So then we go here, um, looking at his display, you know, I put my notes in here whenever I, um, whatever you choose to put to kind of help you remember and guide you. And then, you know, if you click on the tab for post refractive here, I got the um, heel pop and shamus, but um, this is for post myopic formula, even though he's a hyperopic. So, but it's nice in that there's different formulas here that you can select, you know, for RK patients, there's RK formulas and um, different post refractive formulas at your disposal. And, um, and for him, um, we have our, our display with our plan, you know, aiming for 18 doctor lens and correcting his, his sill at the same time using a um, symphony torque and he did really well and very happy that his right eye is now a distance eye and, and has um, very useful near vision at the same time. And so um, the pin and cam AXL allows you to achieve these, um, has helped me in my practice achieve these results. I'm pretty new practice and had brand new techs that never did biometry before. And so they picked it up within a day because the pin and cam guides you and how to um, take the measurements it's pretty pretty amazing the screen and how it allows you to get your accuracy when you when you take the measurement and all the technicians picked on really fast about it and so and i sit down with the patient and i look at their their scans with them and i explain to them what astigmatism is and show them exactly how their eye is unique and i find that patients really appreciate that and it makes more sense to them and it's helped my conversion from someone who would normally get maybe a traditional IOL to convert to a toric or a presbyopic correcting IOL and um, you'll get all that measurements within really 30 to 60 seconds and so and it's increased my efficiency of the practice as well because they're going to one station to get that measurements rather than going to multiple stations to get measurements from to look at all the information that we're trying to get so with that said um be open to any questions thank you dr uh, strange we do actually have some questions here uh, before i get to the questions uh, i'll just let everybody know that if they have any uh, questions about this webinar or about oculus products in general they can contact us at the 800 number shown here or at uh sales at oculususa.com uh, if you missed any part of this webcast or would like to view prior webcasts you can go to our website www.oculususa.com um, we also have another website www.oculustv.com where we have video recorded lectures from uh, medical conventions so i'll get right on to the questions here